It's time once again for the Passion to Succeed podcast, where we explore the traits, mindsets, and attitudes of passionate and successful individuals. This show is for anyone who wants to make a difference, make more money, learn from the greatest minds, and discover how to be more successful in all you do and doing it with a pure passion to succeed. Here's your host, serial entrepreneur, successful author, and the world's most passionate master coach, Craig White. Hi everyone, it's Craig here and welcome to another Passion to Succeed podcast show. I'm really excited today, in fact mega excited to be bringing to you a really empowering podcast show, a podcast show focused on leadership, a podcast show really focused on making a difference with heartfelt leadership and coming from a real place of authenticity. We have an amazing lady joining us today. We have the wonderful Betsy Myers. You know, she is really had even a phenomenal career, you know, leaving uh, Harvard as a graduate and really going into to kind of higher education and, and, and working as an executive director at the, the public leadership at, at Harvard Kennedy School. And she's also been a senior advisor to two U.S. presidents. And today she really is focused on having a worldwide impact and I'm absolutely buzzing to be bringing this show to, to, to you today. So welcome to the show, Betsy. Yeah, I'm uh, just really grateful that you're giving some of your time. So, so oh, thank course. you very much. How, how, are you, how are you finding things now? Are you, um, are you obviously you've been a, a career, focused on your career and you know, until you, you had Madison, did you say? Yes. Yes. And um, and how are you? You know, you you you're obviously still having a massive impact, you know, locally and globally. How are you yes. juggling? Is it is it working well? You know what? I I think you th- there's different stages in your life, and your child needs different things. Mm-hmm. And I think that's been interesting for me because, you know, what I think it's almost people kind of told me that when my daughter was really little, um, you know. That people are like, you know, you, she actually needs you less now than she will when she's a teenager. Or you'll kind of know the different phases, right, yeah. of what's, you know, of what your life, where your life is and, the, you know, the, the, your family and what's going on. So, you know, I think um, that's been interesting for me to kind of navigate that. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, there's always, there's been this long time conversation about balance. And I, I don't think, I think that's, I think. That's not possible. And I think you're always going to, you know, you can have it all, but not maybe all at the same time. Like when I was in my White House days, mm-hmm. you know, I was in my, I think I was 34 when I was in the White House, 35. And, um, you know, I didn't have children. And I, I used to kind of feel sorry for people who did. I can remember thinking, oh my God, how are you doing this? Because it was 24 7 job, right? And part of, you know, those kinds of jobs are you work all day and then at night there's events, dinners, things that you kind of need to go to. We worked Saturdays in the Clinton White House, as most White House do. So on Sunday, you know, I would like, I remember thinking, oh, my God, I just maybe do my laundry and sleep. And so that's different when you have a kid, you know, it's uh, so it's really difficult. I mean, there's this whole shift in, I mean, in the one of the things in my leadership field that we're kind of grappling with is kind of this this notion of overwork and this kind of the way that you know it's kind of the the working world was established by men for men who had stay-at-home wives and we've kind of even though we've evolved as human beings and obviously there's more women in the workplace and the millennials have kind of shaken stuff up um we're still got this kind of old mindset of how work should be and those people who succeed work 80 hours a week and are on call at all times and i think that's we're we're really struggling with that across corporate america because the millennial generation which by the way men and women are gender neutral yep. so men want the same things right it's just like you know you you're kind of on well you're not a millennial you're on the cusp but you know where young men are like, wait a minute, I want to be there for my children. I want to be able to have a, a, a happy marriage. I want to be able to do whatever it is I do. And I want the freedom to run my life. Give me the freedom to run my life. And it's not just butts in the seat. Mm-hmm. So I think that's the interesting thing um, that companies are kind of grappling with. And for me, you know, as I was telling you, I had my daughter at 41. So I was a little bit older. And, um, you know, it's, it's been it's not easy. It's not easy. And I've, I've kind of the last year and a half, I've um, 
I left the university where I was at. I was running a center for women in business. And um, when my daughter went to high school, because I really thought, you know, she really needed me. And um, so I've just slowed down a tad for now and uh, to be here for her. And last year, it was super important for me to be around a lot. So you make, I think you make decisions, or at least I have in my career, about when I can ramp up and when I need to slow down a little bit. And, you know, you kind of adjust accordingly. Hmm. You, you was a, a founder director of um, the the Women in Business uh, Center at Bentley University. Was that how did that come about? Yeah. So when I came off the Obama campaign, um, and again, you know, after the Obama campaign, I did two years um, of uh, that campaign, which was really intense. My daughter was in first grade, and so, you know, I decided, you know, wow, I'm gonna kind of take a break. And I wanted to go back in the leadership field. And even though I find politics, you know, interesting and, and I've loved my time in it, it's I kind of came to this place where, wow, you know, I worked for President Clinton for almost six years. I did two years for Obama. And I kind of stepped back and said, you know, as interesting as it is, where's my real passion? And so I wanted to go back to the leadership field. I had been, before I went to Obama, I had ran a center for leadership at Harvard University Kennedy School called the Center for Public Leadership. Mm -hmm. And I kind of wanted to get back to that. And so I, and my child, I really thought Maddie needed me. And so I was kind of, and then I got my book deal. So Spencer Johnson, he wrote the book, Who Moved My Cheese? Mm -hmm. And um, he was on the board and at Harvard, and he became a very close friend of mine. And sadly, he just we just lost him. He just passed away in July um, of pancreatic cancer. And he, um, but when I came off the campaign, he's like, Betsy, you really need to write a book. And I said, well, I don't want to write a book about the campaign because David Pluff's going to write about that. So he said, No, I think you, I think it's time. And so he connected me to his agent. Her name's Mar Margaret McBride. And then Simon and Schuster bought my book. So in early '09, I had a book deal. And so I was kind of home writing my book and the president of Bentley University, her name's Gloria Larson. And Bentley is a business university. It's one of the top business schools and it's rising um, in, in here in, in, I mean, uh, in the country, but it's in Massachusetts and it's 100 years old. And it was historically an accounting school for men. And then it became accounting for men and women in a university a few years ago. And students go there to get finance accounting. And so she approached me and said, hey, you know, would you be interested in coming to the, the university because we, I, we have all of these corporate partners who recruit our kids. So like major accounting firms and, and, and insurance companies. And she said, they're all struggling with how do they support, retain, advance women in the workplace? And she said, I have this dream to start a center that would concentrate on action steps. So, I mean, unless you're living under a rock, most people will tell you, most CEOs will tell you, we need more inclusion. Mm -hmm. We need to do a better job of, of advancing and retaining our women. But it's not that we don't, we, we all agree, it's how. And we've tried this, we've tried that, and we're still at you know less than 15% in our C-suite and on our board. So she asked me if I would be open, and I said, well, I have my book coming out. And she said, you can do both. So I did that for almost five years, and I left a year and a half ago. Um, I'm a real startup person. I think like you, I like to get things up and going, and um, and it was moving along, and we did this amazing initiative with our governor here called the Governor's Challenge. We had 100 companies that signed up um, in Massachusetts to get to more women in their senior roles, and um, we got on the map. And, uh, and then I left in uh, the end of 15, and I've just been doing my own my own leadership work since then. Fantastic. So you, I mean, you've had a really impressive career, uh, you know, obviously from being a Harvard graduate to, you know, going into the, the leadership role at the, the Harvard Kennedy School uh, that you mentioned. And then obviously you being the, a senior advisor for the for two U.S. presidents. I mean, it's a it's a colourful career. Um, what what set you on a path of, of empowering others and getting involved? Because obviously now going back to I guess your leadership roots and passion, which I'd love to talk to you in more depth about. But sure, what what set you on a on this path to empower others and and make a bigger contribution? Well, you know, it's interesting because I think you know, and you, I was listening to some of your podcasts and. You're in looking at your the work that you've done and this whole issue about passion. And what's interesting for me is I've never really looked for a job. They've kind of come my way. And I think 
from very early on, I kind of had this thought as a kid, which was I didn't want to be average. I didn't know what that meant exactly, but I just I saw a lot of average people living kind of humdrum lives, yeah. <laughs> and it's just you know I always and that from a very early age is like oh I don't want that, and I I kind of see life as an adventure, and um, I'm a big risk taker, and I think you know I grew up my parents were married very young they met in college, my parents were eighteen nineteen and twenty four when they married, and so they you know I kind of watched. My parents, my father was a big exec. He first was a pilot, test pilot, um, and then got into this company called Lockheed. And he worked his way up the, the ladder. And he was very, very, in, you know, very interested in leadership. And he was always kind of talking about the leadership gurus, you know, Tom Peters and Ken Blanchard, who, by the way, in my work at Harvard, I got to know these guys. So that was incredibly meaningful for me. Mm. But so he, and he used to bring home, ideas and thoughts and books and seminars and and I kind of watched him you know with he was very disciplined person and very very devoted and he kind of taught us I'm the oldest of three girls um if you sign up to do something you do it if you say you're going to do it you do it that's who you are your character and then my mother um was stay-at-home mom until I was a teenager and then she, cause she dropped out of college, straight A student to marry my dad and went back to school, finished her degree and got her master's in psychology. And she was very interested. This is in the mid seventies. She was super interested in or late seventies, very interested in the women's movement and Gloria um, Steinem. And she got her master's in psychology and taught women's reentry programs at the college near us. And I, she used to come home with these stories and super interested in in women and kind of some of the issues she was coming across that kind of the struggles of women and so it was kind of the mixture but my mother also brought I think to us this I don't know we felt very loved by her and um safe and my sister Dee Dee who Dee Dee Myers was President Clinton's first press secretary and the first woman and youngest wow. to ever be press secretary. And my youngest sister is a makeup artist in movies and TV programs. Um, so my sister Dee Dee and I have talked a lot about, you know, what did we get from our childhood? And I think one of the things that we took away was risk. We're risk takers. And it's kind of like if you're going to go on this journey to not have an average life, then you can't, you can't, you have to push through the fear and we, Didi and I used to always say, what's the worst thing that can happen? You know, what is the worst thing that can happen? You can quit, you can leave, you can go home. And I think to this day, you know, I, I, we have a very close family and I still think, you know, wow, if, if my life fell apart, I could go be with, live with my sister and my parents are still living. Mm -hmm. You know, so we have this support system. And I, and, I, and I also think the attitude that failure is not so bad. I mean, I've had a lot. I've had a lot of failure in my life and disappointments along the way, or people that betrayed you, or you know, where you skinned your knees, or you know, you weren't as focused as you should be, or you missed the mark, or whatever it was. And I think that there's this feeling in in the U.S. particularly that you know, wow, you know, is failure bad? Like, you know, no. Actually, I always tell people like, failure is more data about yourself. And it's actually a gift. And I've kind of looked at it like that. I, I have, I've had fascination with that. And so anyways, yeah, so that's kind of what I took into my life. So you've had that, that real solid upbringing and that environmental influence from an early age that's, I guess, conditioned you to have this strength of thinking and this character because, you know, every challenge, every part of our journey is character building. But like I think I was mentioning to you earlier that not everybody, I guess, has that environment around them to give them the, the confidence to grow, the confidence to try, the confidence to fail. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I think we got that. I mean, no, nobody has a perfect childhood, you know, but um, but I think we walked away with that kind of determination. It's OK to fail. Um Go for it. Don't give up. And when you fail, keep, you know, try, try again. I think those are really, really important. And I think I've also been a person that's been very fascinated with personal growth. I've always been really interested in, you know, why, why did I, you know, I used to watch people with fascination. Like, what was it about, even in the White House, like, what was it about 
you know, Bob Rubin, who was our who was our Treasury Secretary at the time. And what was it about Bob Rubin that people like literally bowed in respect? Where another cabinet secretary, people wouldn't, you know, they'd be like, whatever. What was that? You know, was that what was that magic? This kind of was the impetus for my book. Like, what what is that magic quality? And what gets in people's way? You know, the self-knowledge. And Warren Bennis, who was one of the greatest leadership authors of all time, he passed away a couple of years ago at almost 90. But he was the chairman of the board at Harvard. And I was so fortunate to cross paths with some of the leadership giants. Yes. But Warren used to say, you know, leadership's about self-knowledge. Like, who are you? And what are the gifts that you have that you, you know, what's the pearl you're adding to the world? But most importantly, what what are the things you're doing that get it getting in your way? You know, what's the what's your sticky floor? And people that are willing to look at that because we we tend I think when you're younger, you know, it's easy to go, oh, whatever happened to me, that was their fault. But by the time you're 40, you're like, hmm, starting to see some patterns of behavior here. Right? <laughs> yeah. We start to take responsibility at least by the time we hit 40, right? <laughs> right. Or, or, you know, that same person keeps showing up. Yeah. Right. But the different body, but the same person and you're having the same issue. Yeah. And it's like, oh, maybe that kind of person, it, maybe I need to look at me. And and I think it's so important. And I think you see people so busy in their life, running, 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 running. And nobody ever steps back to say, well, maybe I'm going to kind of step back and think about what I want next in my life. What are they, Where am I getting in my own way? You know, what, what makes me happy? How do I need to adjust? Um, whatever that is, you know, and I think that's so important. Uh, yeah, it really sits well with me, Betsy. I mean, I've been on my own personal growth and, and continue to do so. And, you know, just I think so many people have these dreams and aspirations of ambitions. And, you know, we, we, obviously the, the big thing now that's come into the world, the secret, the law of attraction and the principles behind that. It's just, oh, it's, it's amazing. And, you know, I think so many people think about what they want, but often forget about who they need to become. Yes. And, and I think sometimes it's the missing link that people, you know, think, you know, I want that ideal partner and they, they need to have these attributes, these values, these, this look, this, you know, these characteristics. Um, but they forget who do they need to become to attract that kind of person. And you can take that across every element of, of our lives and adventure and, you know, whether it's business, whether it's personal life, whether it's, you know, relationships, you know, parenting. I guess you really need to look at yourselves more often than not. Well, yeah. And I also think it's kind of like we look for outside approval of who we are. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the journey too, which is, you know what? It, it's because you, it, I think in a very, in a very, um, in our careers, like in, in our really tough, you know, fast paced, high careers, you, you're going to have people that don't like you and you're going to have people and it can be simply because you're, you know, when I think about my White House days, right, you would have people that you're competing for the president's time, for example. So someone may have a bug about you. It has nothing to do with you, really. That's because you just got the event with the president they wanted or whatever it is. Right. And so learning to like, OK, who am I? What do I stand for? Being able to not take it personally not need people's approval all the time to be able to be, you know, kind of who am I? What do I stand for? You know, what, what are my values? Um, and you're right that. So I think that that's what the journey is in life and not needing other people's um, approval of you all the time and to, to learn to love yourself. I think there's, and I, I don't know. I don't know. I think that the journey of self love and self care is one that is really important. And a lot of times people do everything they can to not look at themselves, overwork, and then the addictions. And if I just find that perfect mate, then, then I'll be okay. But when we really, you know, work to, to inside ourselves, and I've been on that journey too of studying, you know, The Secret. The Secret was my publisher at Simon & Schuster. That was their book, Atria yes. Books. Yep. And, um, but, you know, Louise Hay, who we've got just lost. We've lost a lot of the giants yeah. lately. She mm -hmm. just passed away. Wayne Dyer, mm -hmm. Esther Hicks, mm -hmm. you know, all of these spiritual, you know, leadership that kind of what, how we feel about ourselves and what we think and what we believe is how what we manifest in our lives. And I mean, the legacy these guys have, have, have created um, for years to come is, is phenomenal. Um, oh, which is that's yes. 
Yeah, and you know, again, coming from that message of, of having a greater mission than just themselves, the gifts they've left, the legacy, you know, the the impact, however small or however large on people's lives, is is just going to continue to compound. And you know, your your books really had some great reviews. And 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 you know, how, how long has your you you published your book now? Forgive me, um, two thousand. Yeah, no, it's it's been um, six. It was it was came out in fall of eleven, so it's been almost six years. Six years. Yeah, no, wow. it's six years. Uh, came out September twelfth, so six years almost exactly. Yeah, right. and so we um, have, we have some. I mean, on on our, our kind of listener base, predominantly you know UK, Europe. We we have we have a few thousand constantly growing in the US. Um, typically, people tend to be kind of attracted to our show from a perspective of maybe they're, you know, entrepreneurs, maybe small business owners, large business owners, sole traders, partnerships, you know, pe- people that are even trying to achieve something. I have a, a really good friend of mine that, you know, is really focused on um, traveling the world and, and, and mountaineering and really putting himself under huge risk, huge challenge because it's just the elation that he receives when he, he conquers such a big task through to somebody recently that messaged me um, loving the shows, they're just training for the London Marathon and they just find listening to the shows really powerful. So when you know when we look at your book and, and what we can share to the, to the thousands of listeners, I mean obviously it's um, for those that haven't come across your book yet, it's called Take the Lead, uh, Motivate, Inspire and Bring Out the Best in Yourself and, and Everyone Around You. What, what are the core principles? Because I know you, you mentioned earlier um, about pushing through fears, and I know that's something that you focus on in the book. It's one of the principles you, you talk about. I mean, what other areas of focus in this book can people expect? They grab a copy um, from a you know, taking lead of their life. Well, you know, it's interesting because I, when Simon & Schuster HR Books brought, bought my book, um, it was interesting because I just come off the Obama campaign and the country was really like, wow, you know, nobody, th- it went from nobody thought he could win to like the first black president. Yep. And so it was kind of, wow, how did that happen? And what we saw in the people across this country that got involved and, you know, with no promise of a job or a paycheck or any, you know, a, di- a thank you dinner even. So what was that, that where, where people were most motivated? And we went, I kind of went on a journey to look across my life and career where I'd been with, you know, two presidents in Harvard, but also being a mom and, and all that, those other things in life, because it's not just about having a big job, right? But where, where was it across my life that I see people most motivated? And where was I most motivated? Mm-hmm. And what came out of my journey was, wow, it's, it's when we feel valued and appreciated and part of something bigger than ourselves and thanked. And Tom Peters used to say, or Ken Blanchard used to say, does say, you can live for three months on one compliment. And so my book is really that leadership creates a feeling. It's a really different way to think about leadership because when I was writing this book, I was thinking there's so many wonderful leadership books out there. What am I saying that's different? And leadership creates a feeling, meaning that when people feel valued and appreciated and included, they do their best work. And when they don't, they don't. And, you know, it took me back to like even my my fifth grade teacher when I was 10. What was it about Hugh Beaton that made me want to work harder, jump higher? What was it about Bill Clinton? You know, Bill Clinton had a way about him, has a way about him where you're in his presence and he saw you and he thanked people. And, you know, he did things all the time. It's one story. Actually, I didn't, didn't tell this in my book, but such a great Bill Clinton story, which was we did this big event and it was a, he vetoed a bill and um, it was a very controversial issue. And we brought families around uh, to support him. And I was in charge kind of of this whole event and bringing the families and making sure all the details were, were done. And when the event was over, um, he was very happy with how it went. And he asked to see me and they came and got me. So the president wants to see you. So I went into the Oval Office and he literally was sitting behind his desk, got up, came over to me and said, I know how hard you worked on this event. I'm so happy how it went. He had took my hand. He put five pens in my hand. You know, when a president signs a bill or vetoes a bill, gives pens to the people who participated or had something to do with it. He said, here's a pen for each family. And he put a six pen in my hand. He said, this is for you. And yeah, that, and that, you know, interaction took what five minutes. Mm -hmm. And to this day, you know, I have that pen. It's, I walked out of that office 
the Oval Office that day, and I thought, you know what, I, I, I'm so energized to keep, and people think, you know, those jobs are, they're, they're very, they're, you know, people think, oh my God, you're so amazing every minute. No, there are amazing moments, but you work like crazy. You have no life. The pay is not that great. And, uh, but he had a way of making people feel part of the team, valued, appreciated. So I looked at, I looked at, you know, times in my life where I felt that way. And it's really the impetus for the book. And it's a different way to think about leadership. I don't think most people think leadership creates a feeling. No, and, and, and you talk about the importance of connecting other, connecting with others on a deeper level. And I guess that's the message that you're, you're sharing here with, you know, what Bill you know, Clinton has done in this example. But the book is like, you know, so the principles that I talk about are ways to get, you know, to get yourself and others to feel valued and appreciated. And I talk about your authenticity and connection and continued learning and clarity. You know, clarity, it's interesting in my work that one of the number one reasons why people fail in a job, and I used to ask, you know, leaders and executives, well, what's the number one reason why someone on your team failed? And overwhelmingly, the response was because they weren't clear about what their job was. And, you know, a lot of times because we're so busy, right, we don't have time, we don't have the interaction with our people the way we should. And so we miss sometimes, well, what are you actually working on? Where are you struggling? And people go down a road working on X when you think they're working on Y, but because there's no interaction and then you catch it too late. And, but when you have constant, you make, I mean, every successful leader has some kind of walking around strategy, connection strategy to their team because the answers for everything you need are right there with your team if you're willing to ask and great leaders that's what they do and um it's 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 you know i think in the the old model of leadership was i should have all the answers but in today's world leaders are leaders who are willing to ask the questions of the people around them because how can you possibly know everything and the bigger portfolio that you manage the less you can be on top of everything and so you have to rely on your people and create an atmosphere of trust and not fear and safety um, and care that people will tell you the truth and the answers are right there with your team if you're willing to interact with them. And so many leaders, I'm too busy, I'm traveling, I'm moving, I have so many meetings, I don't have time. No, you, you, you don't have time not to. And it's a reverse thinking. Yeah, so I mean, I've watched a lot of your videos and you have this real heartfelt way of, of putting your message across, you know, great tonality, mannerisms, and you, it's, the message I, I'm, I'm feeling from is just this new, new thinking, this new direction of, of heartfelt leadership rather than, you know, structured, this is how you're going to be, this is what you're going to do kind of leadership. And you talk about it as an, a new thinking of leadership. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, listen, it's not, a, it's not a brand new concept, but I think it's like people, I think it's interesting for, you know, everybody has to step, that's why the self-knowledge is so important. It's like, where am I on the spectrum here? And when, you know, because you, it's really the balance of the head and the heart, right? It's, you know, the, the head is the strategy, the focus, the perseverance, and the heart is the caring, the listening, the bringing people along, and you need both of those. And I think people have to look and see where am I on the spectrum and how do people feel about me? You know, it's really your reservoir of goodwill. You all, I always tell people, you know, like people that you love and that you admire and that you respect, you know, you'll walk on coals for them and other people that you don't, you won't. Mm -hmm. And so as a leader, how do people, I always say, how do people feel about you? You know, do people respect you? Do they like you? Do they um, want to go the extra mile for you? And, and you see that in companies. You know, I talk a lot about Southwest Airlines. You know, it's this, you know, airline here in the U.S. that, and it's actually just gone international, that they have, you know, most most of the studies show that, mo that most Americans, and actually this is mirrored globally, 50 to 70% of people are disengaged in the workplace. And I always tell leaders that you can bet 50% of your people aren't working up to their max. And, um, but at Southwest, it's like they, their engagement studies show like 92% will go the extra mile. And their whole company is based on love and they talk about it. And that's what's interesting, right? Love in the workplace. But their whole concept is if you, and it's so basic, it's like what you learn in kindergarten. If you love your people, your people will love your customer. And if your customer feels love, they'll keep coming back. And if they keep coming back, we make money. 
Yep. And it's so simple. And that's they, they have this whole philosophy. And I always tell people it's not just about being nice because nice is nice, but nice also is profitable. When people feel valued and included and, and cared about, they engage and do their best work and then you make money. So that's what's interesting about it. It isn't just be nice for, you know, because it's a nice thing to do. It's because it's actually a strategy that is in the end profitable and people will stay at your company and work to their best if they feel like you care about them. Yeah, fabulous. It's so simple, isn't it? <laughs> well, it, it is, and it, you know, it should be world spread. And I think you know, them, them figures of you know, fifty-seven percent of people in, in the workplace and are just not engaged. I read something, uh, an interview of yours. I think it was with your, one of your local um, papers, um, and you were just talking about how people you know, stumble into work, switch the computer on, next thing they know it's 11 o'clock, they think they best have some lunch and then it's two yes. o'clock and they think, hang on a minute, it's four o'clock and they've done absolutely nothing, nothing. in that day um, to to actually have any level of success. And I, and, and I sat there and I thought to myself for a moment, I mean, I've, I've not worked here from a, being an employed perspective now for, well, well over 19 years. I spent two years traveling the world with my, with my surfboard and living on a beach. And then, you know, wow. so the... the the passion that resides in me to respect myself enough to employ myself, that, that never happens. I'm engaged, you know, all the time um, in what I'm doing at, at any given time. But it made me think about the past and and then it just made me visual. You know, you're just like reading something and you, I'm very visual and I start thinking about people stumbling into the office. And I just can just see it as that common nine to five where people, you know, haven't got any passion about what they're doing. And, it, and it's a shame. Yeah. I mean, most people tell you, I, every audience I speak to, I'm always like, how many, what's the first thing you do in the morning? Get on a computer. And then they sit there. And, you know, it's really interesting. There was this study done by, uh, by a professor in Irvine, California. She, she went to this company in Northern California, and she wanted to do this study. And they agreed for one week to not use email mm -hmm. in the company. And at the end of the week, she went back and they, 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 they had such a fun week because they had to communicate by phone or in person. They were connecting um, and colliding with each other. And they were sorry that they had to go back to email. And, you know, it's uh, I think we work can be a very lonely people sit at their computer and their cubicles all day long. And I think we we're and, you know, for all the wonderful aspects of technology, I think it's not a substitute for human contact and human contact is what where magic happens. You know, a lot of companies are trying now the whole issue of Harvard Business Review was on colliding, which is where companies desire to figure out how do you get people off their computers and running into each other. Uh, and when that happens, they share, they are more creative, innovative, they connect, they go, oh, I didn't know you were working on this, I'm working on that. You should come to this meeting or let's talk about that, you know, and that's where technology, I think, in the workplace is maybe a big part of the reason why the productivity has gone down. It, you know, for all the positive, I think we're losing the um, people skills. And with our young people who, you know, my God, I mean, that's something companies are really really seeing you know a difference in is the lack of ability to communicate because everything's done via the phone it's, and it's, cra it's, it's crazy because you you know you think you know i mean obviously I, i've just turned 40 we were discussing earlier and you know i look at you know now i go back to when i used to be a teenager and you'd, you'd be so organized with what you're doing from a simple like who you're going to meet when you're going to meet them exactly where you're going to meet them and the the conversation prior would be you know uh, you'd be communicating you'd be conversing you'd be very organized and then you'd meet you'd be meeting your friends under the clock tower at 2 30. there was none of this oh i'll text you when i get into town and it's almost yeah. like as, as great as technology is and you know i love that technology is there it's always about making life easier typically which isn't always best um but you know i completely completely agree you know texting and emails are for information not conversation and this right. is something that i try to share with a lot of people that i coach and mentor is that you really need to you know quality of our life lies within the quality of our relationships so andy robbins is famous for, for 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 that and i think you know too many people are missing that link of relationships oh. as, you, as you're saying Oh, it's so important. I mean, relation. Everything we get done in our lives is by relationships. 
You know, when you think about it, right, it's, it's everything we get done. And how do you, you know, a lot of times, like, you know, when you get that email and then you're sitting there typing an email response and it's taking you 30 minutes because it's whatever it is, it's a lot. A lot of times I'll just pick up the phone and call the person and be like, you, you email me this, this is what I was thinking. And then you start talking about other things and you find out, oh, I didn't know you were working on that. Or that's really interesting. This is happening. It's so much better. And um, I mean, not that email and texting don't have their place, and it does, but it doesn't replace the human interaction, and it does not help build relationships, I don't think. No, no, I totally agree. So, so where where are you now on your on your your journey? Because you've had, as as we discussed, a really impressive career. You have a beautiful young daughter that we were discussing is now fifteen, and you, you obviously you made a decision that you really want to be there. What what are you passionate? about now what are you what's the next the next part of your journey what are you up to well um so so the last like year and a half i've just been on my own with myers leadership and just doing a lot of public speaking going into companies events and speaking um on everything from my book to um i have a, a talk that i do around how do you be yourself but be strategic in your life and um around uh kind of self-knowledge and the relationships we build and how we spend our time do a lot of work around women in leadership, working with companies on their women's leadership strategy. And um, and and I'm kind of noodling around on a second book. Okay, and I'm very interested. Yeah, I'm very interested in how we, as life progresses and things happen to us, how we remake ourselves and how we evolve um, in our leadership. You know, because I always say that, that each one of us is a leader, right? We're, the lead, we're leading our own lives. And... And kind of how how we as human beings and leaders of our own lives, you know, as our lives evolve, as we change, as we see ourselves in one capacity and then, you know, something happens, a divorce, a death, um, our kids go off to uh, you empty, become an empty nester. What, you know, how do we evolve as human beings and learn and grow? And I'm very interested in that piece of kind of and, and also how we the resilience piece of our life, right? And so I'm very interested in that. I'm really interested in the leader in, the leader of you, the leader in each of us. Mm-hmm. Brilliant. So you, you mentioned then about being you, I guess being authentic whilst re- being strategic. How how do you and how, how can others achieve that? What's what's the, the thinking behind you know, managing that? Well, I came up, I wor- was working with MetLife on this particular work and we I came up with this, this um, keynote and training that I do around this because I've seen a lot of people in, across my career kind of in the aspect of I'm being my authentic self blow up their careers. So I kind of stepped back and, I, and working with some of the senior leaders at MetLife, we were kind of looking at like, if I'm being myself, okay, that's where the self-knowledge piece, like, first of all, a lot of people just they just let they just let life come at them, right? It's kind of like I'm an inbox, I'm a giant inbox, and so whatever comes at me, whatever everybody needs from work, my family, whatever everybody needs, I'm just responding all the time. And instead of stepping back and saying, "Wait a minute, who am I? Where am I going? What matters to me?" Most women I run into will tell you they're exhausted, and that's also the impetus for this work. Mm-hmm. They're exhausted, and they just they have this you know, frenzied way of living. And I kind of was like, I think we can, we need to, we need to challenge that. Right. So what matters to you when you're really clear about what matters to you in your life, and then you are able to make decisions according to that on your schedule. So I always use this as an example. Like if you say like for a long time, I was saying, I'm going to write a new book. And, but I, but I wasn't really writing it. I was noodling on it. And so you can't say you're writing a new book. If you look at your calendar and you go, where have I spent my time over the last two months? You can't say you're writing a book if you're not spending any time writing your book. You can't say you go to yoga if you never go to yoga. You know what I mean? It's like, I'm an avid yoga, you know, but when's the last time you went? Well, three months ago. So that was part of it, which was, okay, what matters to you? And if you know what success is for your life and you're clear about that, then you make decisions based on what matters to you and what's your A's. I say, what's your A's? So if I care about my daughter and I care about my leadership career, 
And then I make decisions based on that. And so a lot of the C's and D's fall off. A lot of people feel, I always tell, use this as an example, but someone will call you and say, we're doing this conference in Boston and I'd love for you to be a panelist. And I might, you know, say off the top of my head, sure. But then you look at it. Maybe it's not paid. It's in an, an area I'm not interested in. Um, it doesn't work for me, but I already said yes. So now what I do is I take every invitation and I say, thank you for the, the invite. Let me see. Let me think. Let me get back to you. And does it fit into my goals and what success looks like? Then you make decisions based on that. And if you if it doesn't work, you just call and say, I have a schedule. You know, it doesn't work in my schedule. Thank you so much for the opportunity. But what happens is we say yes to everything. We run ragged. And what happens is when you're clear about what matters and you make decisions, your A's are things that move, things you do that move your, your, what matters to you forward. B's are things that move forward, but maybe don't have to do today. C's and D's are just optional. And we get mired in C's and D's. So when you start getting clearer about what success looks like and you start doing A's and B's, you free up time in your life and that you can breathe. So you're saying no to the, some of the things that are clogging your schedule in your life. The other thing that I, that I saw in career is like, there was a woman I worked with in the white house this is a perfect example who was on the speech writing team. And, um, she was really good at what she did, but she also, um, kind of let people know what she thought about them in meetings. Hmm. And so she, was not strategic about who am I talking to? How am I dealing with this person? How do they hear me? She would just shoot from the, the hip, right? Okay. And they moved her out of the White House. And it wasn't because of her talent. It was because she wasn't strategic about how she was showing up and, and with the relationships. Okay. So that's what this talks about too, is how do I spend my time? And then how am I conscious and thoughtful about how I'm dealing? And I, I you the example of, of, of my boss in the Obama uh, campaign, who is a complete introvert, and I'm a huge extrovert. And I really realized early on, like, he didn't really want to be my friend. And he didn't, he certainly didn't want to sit around talking about our families. And he didn't want to have lunch or coffee with me. And it wasn't personal. He was a total introvert. He was stressed out of his mind that, you know, he was kind of leading the strategy and leading the whole campaign. And I realized, wow, I could take it personally, or you step back and say, wait a minute, I, the leader in me, took this job, I work for him, how do I make his life easier, how does he hear me, what does he need? And what I realized is he needed very little interaction, he needed very, very quick to the point emails, very, the less said the better, Mm -hmm. Um, and that's what I started to do, to gain, you know, a relationship with him. So it's treating people how they want to be treated, not how you want to be treated. And that's being strategic. Oh, fantastic. Brilliant. You know, Betsy, it's been it's been an absolute pleasure speaking to you today to, to get to know you a little bit more. I mean, just, you know, looking and, and studying some of your work. As I said, you know, it's been a real pleasure to be able to to, to speak to you myself and selfishly indulge in your mind and your voice, and but also importantly, share it with with the listeners within the passion to succeed community i'm i'm very grateful i really appreciate your time guys if if you uh, want to and and really i advise you do is get over to to betsymyers.com it's b-e-t-s-y-m-y-e-r-s.com um there's an abundance of uh, information on there inspiration and some empowering ideas that you link to to a fabulous book take the lead and um you know, Betsy, I hope that when you launch your, your next book, we'll get you back on another show and, and discuss that and, and what you're fascinated with in a bit more detail. So, hey, thank you very much again for your time and, and I wish you a, a really wonderful day. You too, Craig. Thank you so much. If you enjoyed today's show, we would appreciate it if you would like. Most people share through social media. Then subscribe, rate and provide a review over at iTunes and SoundCloud. That's all for today. Thank you for joining us. The Passion to Succeed show is brought to you by passiontosucceed.com. Get over to the website, subscribe, and join the community of passionate people.